So the video is now recording. Like I said, it's all on for young and old now. So beware where you put your fingers. Um, don't touch your face. <laughs> we'll yeah. See what happens. I go. I'm going to dive straight into this. And um, like I said, usually if there's any errors, it usually comes from my end. So sit back and relax. Here we go. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast. The podcast is on to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. Before I introduce my amazing guest today, just want to give everyone a reminder that my next 12-week podiatry business reboot is kicking off on Thursday, May the 6th. So if you want more details, about, well, if you think about, I think my business needs a little bit of kick in the pants, or you're just starting out in business and you've got a few things in place, but you know you need you're missing systems. You're missing this parts about your business that you just know you need help with. The 12 week reboot may be what you're looking for. So go to my website, tysonfranklin.com, click on the coaching box. There's a drop down panel. All the information is on there. So my guest today is Chloe Weir. Now, she is the Woodvale podiatrist. She is over in Perth. And today we're going to be talking about a lot of things, but we're going to focus on this machine called Swift. So, Chloe, how are you doing today? Yeah, really good. Thank you. So we've known each other for a little while now. Probably it's been yeah. over a year, I think. Nearly a year. Yeah. Nearly I think year. May, May possibly last year. That was I knew of you before then. but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you still spoke to me, which is good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you, you, we originally connected through the 12 week reboot. Yes, that's right. Right, so you're a graduate of the 12-week reboot. So I am. Oh, so well, got you. I didn't actually have you on to talk about that, but what was your opinions of the reboot by the time we finished it? Yeah, I I really enjoyed it. I think um, I've made it no secret that I was sat on the fence about actually doing it, and um, I I think a lot of the content is stuff that I knew bits about, but I wasn't implementing, and it just gave me that kick to to actually get into gear and get the systems in place um, and and make things things better for for me and for the business it was it was definitely what I needed and, and one of the the more exciting things that's come out of it is I've now got this this team or family of people who are there to help um, and that's that's ongoing we've got those friendships and relationships there yeah and that was the funny part when we because you're in the first group of the yes. reboot that we started so at the moment I'm doing group four and what was interesting as we got towards the end of the first group, I, think, I can't remember who said, it, but somebody said, I'm going to miss everybody when this is all over. Yeah. And that's when I went, well, actually I'd thought about putting together a membership group where people that do the reboot, if they want to join into it, they can. And that's what we sort of kicked off afterwards. That's the podiatry business Spartans. And geez, we have a lot of fun in there, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. No, it's, it's useful, but it is fun as well. It's, uh, it's good, especially if you're a sole practitioner, like it's, it's ideal yeah. to, to have that support, but just the, the different stages that everybody's at in their career or business and you, you learn so much. And I think even the more experienced people would say they learn heaps from the group as well. Well, that's the part I, I thought was interesting. So I was never, it sounds funny, but I was never really into group coaching programs prior to the whole COVID the vid and it wasn't until i did a group coaching program that i realized geez this is actually fun and i actually made some really good friends through this group coaching program and i went ah now i understand why some podiatrists especially if you're a solo practitioner and you spend all day every day with yeah you might have some support staff but you're still the only podiatrist that you talk to most days and i i can see where yourself and a few of the others in the group where you guys connect with each other really well. And whenever you've got a question, bang, you just throw it in the group. Everyone is so fast just to dive in there and actually help you out. So, but anyway, we're not here to talk about that. Let's talk about you a little bit. So people may have noticed you have a slight accent. Yeah. That, that's not a Perth accent that they can hear. No, but, no, Unless no. you're in the United <laughs> States, we all sound the same. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're originally from the UK. I am, yes. Um, so I, I graduated over in the UK, um, studied at the University of Huddersfield, um, graduated and worked for two years in the NHS, which was a very interesting start to, to my career. Yeah. Um, certainly gave me, me good experience. Um, and I think like I, I went into a position that was very well supported and mentored. And after maybe nine months, I, I only moved, well, nine to 12 months, I moved 
only because it was closer to home. And I went into another area where I think as a, as a new graduate probably wouldn't have been the, the systems weren't in place um, as well but both of them I learned a lot and got got good experience from um, but then we got the opportunity to come and move to Australia um, which was in 2008 and we initially moved to Brisbane had six years over in Queensland um, had the, one the, of those the sunshine state yes yeah <laughs> definitely I think it's still one of my favorite places that we traveled a lot um in up and down the coast um where, where did you work when you're in Brisbane what, what where area, did I work yeah what area of Brisbane were you in um I started off the, primarily on the north side I was I started in Kalanga um okay. and then after that worked mainly in the gap so yep. sort of west and north west um of Brisbane um, and then we had I also did some clinics up in Mount Isa so that was oh, another, okay. another interesting area same company that I worked for in Brisbane that had a clinic up there um, used to go up for two weeks at a time and did did a few stints up there so that was was a really interesting insight into different different patients some of it was similar but you also got some yeah some and other, if anyone's listening yeah. to this who's overseas Mount Isa is in like it's a mining town in the middle of nowhere in Queensland. So yeah. it's about, was it, about 400 kilometres inland from Townsville, wasn't it? Something like that? I think so. I can't remember exactly how far, but I remember um, we took on somebody from the UK and she was getting put into that position permanently. Uh -huh. um, and her question was, how far is the nearest beach? And we, we thought that was hilarious. So she clearly hadn't done too much research prior to uh, so accepting the job because yeah there's not there's not many beaches for a long long way no, it's only about five hour drive yeah exactly so yeah, so yeah that, that was good and then then I had a year in Bundaberg um which was more to we, we've moved around a fair bit with my husband's work he's an engineer and that was that was a good experience in Bundaberg um Bundaberg, right. yes yeah good. it's Yep, good room, nice beaches, yeah. <laughs> nice relaxed lifestyle. Um, and then we went overseas for three months. We we both took three months out and went traveling and um, went to South America for the, the FIFA World Cup um, in Brazil, which was really okay. good. And then when we came back, we ended up in Perth. Um, and we've Why had- Perth? Why Perth of all places? Again, my husband's work, we got, we got offered either Sydney or Perth and we were at a stage where we wanted to buy a house and we wanted to have kids and he's always based in the city centre and we just didn't think Sydney was going to work for us. I think Perth in a lot of ways is quite like Brisbane. Brisbane's a bit, bit more advanced, mm -hmm. um, but it's that sort of small, smaller town feel to it whilst being a city. Um, we knew that we could live relatively close to the beach and it's a very, very relaxed lifestyle. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's the I've only thing. I've only been to Perth once and I really, really liked it. And like you said, did, it did remind me almost like a slash between Brisbane, but almost the feel of the Gold Coast. Everyone was yeah. a little bit more relaxed than a, than a capital city should be. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. And I think the only thing we didn't like when we moved, I've mentioned that we, we like to travel and to get anywhere from Perth. Um, <laughs> it takes so not, not the time, probably the money. It just costs to, so much to get anywhere. Hence why everybody in Perth tends to go to Bali because it's cheap. Um, yeah. But that isolation's come in pretty useful with COVID. Um, we've been one of the more protected states, which is good. Yeah, that's why Queensland and Western Australia get on so well. Yeah. Is because we, we do, we have, we're, big state we're quite large states or well, western australia is huge but we've got so many places that are so isolated from everywhere else which has worked very well with the whole um covid situation definitely yeah it's great. Perth, perth just don't like people the, the whole western australia they just got a big fence up to keep everybody else out yes that, that is the impression we're giving at the moment hopefully that'll <laughs> change but uh yeah so did you when you first went to perth i take you work for somebody else you you didn't set up for yourself straight away I didn't know so in Brisbane I'd always worked for others and then in Perth um, I I'd been offered a position before we moved over and I worked for them for well, I wasn't there very long actually probably about three four months and I fell pregnant um, yeah. so then went off on maternity leave and went back again 
fell pregnant again. Um, and it was at the end of that second stint of maternity leave that I was presented an opportunity to set up my own business. Um, and I think the biggest lesson from this, it came at a time where nothing was, was ideal. Um, and I, I sat there and thought, what do I do? Do I go back to where I was working and it's comfortable or do I take the chance and the opportunity and just try and make it work? And thankfully it has. Um, I think I'd have been, been a bit stupid to, to not take the opportunity. So basically in the area where we live, um, there was a psychiatrist and they moved probably yeah. about 10 kilometers away. Um, and there was not another psychiatrist in our area. So I was chatting to one of the GPs one day. I'd seen that they'd gone and we got talking about it. She was like, I've got a room you can rent if you wanted to set up on your own. Her opinion was if she was a psychiatrist, she'd jump on the chance. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Kids are going to be going to school nearby. Um, they were at daycare at that time. The biggest thing was my son was just turning one. And I was like, I haven't really got a lot of time. But I did. I've got a very supportive husband um, and we've just made it work. I've kept it part time. And now that both kids are at school, we're, we're hitting a point where I can start to invest a lot more time into the business. Um, and yeah, that's that's how it came up. So initially I did end up doing both. I went back to where I was working and um, set up my own business had a few hurdles along the way. Um, after six months, I, I moved premises and just because I was growing, the doctors were wanting to grow and it was never going to fully work out there. Um, so I moved, thankfully moved just across the road and moved in with some physiotherapists and it's gone pretty well. Um, so what we said earlier on though, that you didn't wait until everything was perfect to do it. Yeah. And I think some people, when it comes to having their own business, they might be working somewhere else and you've got the safety and the security of that regular income coming in every week. So it doesn't really matter whether you're working super hard, yeah, especially if you're not on, if you're just on a, a set pay, not on a percentage. But even if you're on a percentage, it's almost guaranteed sort of week by week what you're going to make. And to take that leap, sometimes I think some people wait too long. They are, everything has to be perfect before they make that leap. And I don't think there's ever a perfect time. No. So, no. And I think. But, if I, if I hadn't took that opportunity, I would have wasted a very good opportunity to have my own business in an area that was, there was a big demand for podiatry. Um, and yeah, I, I would have kicked myself if I'd have gone, no, it's not for me at this time. I had a couple of friends say to me, or oh, do you really want the pressure of that? But to me, I was like, I can, what have I got to lose? Essentially, I guess it, I was lucky from the respect. My husband had a stable job, so we, we weren't reliant upon my income for that um which you know some people might not be in that situation but it was definitely um about one of the best things i've done yeah like you said what's the worst that can happen well you can lose your hair yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah i've got a few more gray hairs now and my husband's yeah lost some of his hair but yeah i know like but i i, I totally understand why some people don't want to have their own business yeah they yeah. they like the security yeah. of and they don't want the headaches. They, they want to have the holidays. And I totally understand that. And I understand people who just want to work for themselves. And I get the people that are sort of in between, but they're just not sure. When do I take the jump? Should I take the jump? And I always look at it this way. I always used to say to myself, what's the worst possible outcome if I do such and such? And I'd look at it and go, well, if I can live with that and it's not going to kill me, then I'm going to do it. Because if, the, if that's the worst that can happen that doesn't kill you, then what doesn't matter. And if it didn't work out, you could always go back and get another job. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I feel like for me, the way that I've done it, it's worked quite well. I, I always wanted my own business. I said that from the moment I left university. Um, but the experiences I've had along the way have taught me a lot. And I feel like that then put me in a better position to run my own business. Um, you know, people do make it work going opening up their own business from when they graduate but I think I I definitely appreciate the experiences I got in the different working situations and uh and yeah like you say you you make it work it's it is what it is and yeah and it, it doesn't matter look and and I think some people when we're talking about waiting for the perfect time they might say oh I don't know anything about business well the best way to learn it is by doing 
is by just yeah. jumping in there doing it and then going off and doing courses and learning other things. I was mentioning to you before we pressed record that I just come back from a tradies um, workshop, business workshop. So everybody in the room, there's carpenters and plumbers and electricians and solar panel and pool builders and, and house builders. And here I am sitting in this workshop with all these tradies. It was so cool because what the guy was teaching them was you would swear he was talking to a room full of podiatrists. They were all had the same fears, the same problems. They, some of them, they'd only been in business for a little while and were making the same mistakes that podiatrists make. So it doesn't matter what the industry is. It's never going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes, but if you can like say, get a coach or go to events and learn from other people, I think that's what you got to do. And then you just get better. Yeah. So, and I think you could actually be an employee. You could go to a million workshops. It's not until you open the doors that you really understand uh, how it all applies. Yeah. It's a bit like when you do your podiatry degree. I remember I struggled with some of the concepts of biomechanics, but when the patient was in front of you, it just made way more sense. Um, you know, it's the same, same thing. Once you've seen the patients and the problem presents, you understand what's happening a lot more than when it's just written on a book. Um, well, it's like Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. So I, I think it's the same thing. You can sit there and you can plan out exactly what your business is going to be like. You can go and get a business coach, go and do a ton of courses, but it's not until you put that key in the door, you open it up and that's your business that you get your first punch in the face. Then it's how do you actually deal with that? Can you then call upon all that training or that, that education you've taken on? Yeah. So it's worked out for you, which has been good. It has. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that probably kind of leads us into, into what we're meant to be talking about. In that, um, <laughs> oh, no, we, before we, we get onto that, okay, yeah, go on. yeah. before we get onto that, the reason um, I wanted to get your background is because I just think it's really important for anyone that's listening to the podcast and listens to multiple guests to just hear that everybody sort of their experience through podiatry or their journey through podiatry is completely different. Very few of us have the same journey or the same story. There's, well, you've gone from the UK to Brisbane to Bundaberg, Mount Isa, still yes. survived it, and then over in Perth. And I know some people, they might be born and bred in Brisbane, they get a job in Brisbane, and they go from North Brisbane to South Brisbane. That's about as big a move as they're going to do. Oh, not many people do that. No. <laughs> no. So I just think it's good for, for people to get a, a good understanding of, you know, even though we're, we're about to talk about Swift is just yeah who the, who the podiatrists are they're actually in the profession so you've had your own practice it's been going long for a while were you treating a lot of warts beforehand over the years i would say hit and miss not that many but it seemed to be after i opened my own practice so many people coming in the door had warts um, and it was something I hated treating. It was something I'd not really had much success with in the past. I probably didn't have, you know, really good treatment protocols with the different methods. Um, and I just, I didn't like treating them. They were too unpredictable. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden I was getting all these people in and it just started to make me think what, what else is there? Um, and it was another colleague who actually more introduced me to to swift um and i started sending one or two patients off to them and then the more that i was getting in the door i thought well, why not look into this myself um, so you were referring them on initially to somebody else that had a swift machine yeah only only for a short while um i think at that stage when he like he he went out and approached everybody and said look i've got got this equipment it was that and a, a fungal nail laser um and he'd reached out to a lot of people and i i caught up with him and went and looked at the machine discussed what it did and i i think i sent one or two people to him um and i think it's that going back to things never being a perfect time is at that point i went i'm only working a couple of days a week it's an expensive piece of equipment do i really want to take that chance um but I also knew that I wanted a point of difference and it was also something that was going to make my life easier. Yeah. I remember going to my husband and saying, I'm looking at this piece of equipment and he looked at me and he said, but why do you want something that's treating the thing that you hate treating? <laughs> and that was then the decision. It's like, well, I either 
send all the wart patients elsewhere. I just go, we don't treat warts or I find a solution that has better success rates and those things. And that, that was my argument back to him was, well, it's something that's going to give me more predictable outcomes. Um, I have patients will have more confidence. And also it's that point of difference at that time there was a handful of clinics across Perth, if that, that had one. Um, so I, I went, if I'm going to buy something, I want something that not every clinic has got. It's yeah. got to be, you know, I, to me, jump, jump into it before it becomes more mainstream. Um, I'd seen enough to know that it, it should be pretty successful. And I thought, why not? Let's, let's take the chance and, and give it a go. And, and I'll just point out to people, we're not being sponsored by Swift. On this no, not episode. at all. <laughs> we just thought it was something we had a conversation. And went, well, that'd be really interesting to talk about if anyone had thought about getting one to actually hear someone who's got one and how they used it. And so, what, what, how much were they at the time when you bought it? In say, I uh, around I think it was about eighteen thousand dollars. That's not too bad. Yeah, uh, it's. Well, it depends who you say that to. Some people, uh, I think, I remember one of the clinics, one of the receptionists was like, I could get a small car for that. And I'm like, yeah, but you lose money on a car. You you know. You ever try to treat a wart with a car? It doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Unless yeah. you run over the foot and get it amputated. But, and I find that funny when people are looking at different equipment. I'm, I'm always one of these, I've always had the thinking, if a piece of equipment was say worth $20,000, if you had twenty thousand dollars sitting in your bank account, what return are you getting on that money? Now, if you just had it, yeah. doesn't matter where you have it invested. If you bought a piece of equipment, can you get a better return on that twenty thousand by investing it in equipment? And usually, the answer is always one hundred percent yes. So yeah. that, and even if you borrowed the money, you borrowed twenty thousand to buy it. What your repayments are going to be with what you can make from it is going to far outweigh the repayments. So that, then it's a good investment. Yeah. Okay. So you decided you were going to get it. Your husband, you convinced your husband that this was a good idea. Yeah. And he said, yep. Okay. You've convinced me. You should do it. You bought it. You installed it. How did it go? Did it live up to your expectations? Oh, definitely. Yes. I think initially um, I, it didn't take long. Like we, I didn't do that much promotion of it and before i before long i would start to get people coming through the door um for it and i think one of the biggest things i i wrote really good information on my website about it um i went around and, and told some of the local gps as didn't really attract many patients that way a lot of them come either from just naturally turning up in the clinic and i think in fact up until last week i think every patient when i taught them through the options for wart treatments went let's do swift until last week and i had one who was like oh, i'm not sure i, I want to try something else. she wanted something instant that was going to get rid of the war instantly i'm like well there's nothing that will do that but um and yeah i everybody who came in chose it or i was getting people through google because Generally, you can use it on any wart, but generally it works well for the ones that have failed other treatments. So people are out there specifically looking for other options. And I just made sure that I came up when, when they searched it. And I've had people travel from the other side of Perth, even though there's clinics nearer to them yeah. with it. Um, it's attracted people in that way. And you know, I've had some really ec ecstatic patients. Um, it's not 100% successful. There, there's definitely been a couple where we've had, um, you know, we haven't had the outcome, but that's, that's all explained to the patient. There's no, no guarantees. I think the, the official stats say that it's, um, it's 84% successful, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but uh, they, I, I sat down the other day and worked out mine and I'm probably, I haven't got some of the stats from when I was working in, in another clinic. Um, so I can't be 100% certain on, on my outcomes and some of them are unknown and patients just disappear. Um, but I'd say around 75 to 80% is my success rate. So I'm sitting pretty close to that yeah. um, at the so moment. When you get failures, when, when there is a failure, have you been yeah. able to put it down to anything? Is it the the size, the depth, the location? Is there anything like that? Sometimes I think um, 
it varies. So it, I wouldn't say there's one common theme. I think sometimes it's down to patient tolerance and them not allowing us to, to turn it up quite high enough. But then I've had others where I've used it on a much lower level and they've resolved. Um, sometimes, like one that I can think of was a particularly large and extensive lesion. Um, but I also suspect, and I know from talking to other colleagues, that basically the way that SWIFT works, it stimulates your immune system to fight off the wart. So it's different to your acids and cryo that yeah. destroy the tissue. We're actually just disrupting the cells. So some Doesn't of the theories... Because I have heard, uh, I have heard some people say, yeah, I've had done it on younger people and they haven't complained. And then I've done it on, yeah, macho men. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're squealing like a little girl. But they're yeah. done on little girls and little girls are sitting there going, no, it's not that bad. So yeah. is it the same thing? Is it just patient's threshold... Definitely. Yeah. And sometimes it's really hard to work out because I've had patients say, oh, I've got a high pain threshold, or it might be a woman who's gone through childbirth and they've found it more, they've gone, that's really intense. But then I have yeah. had younger patients or others who sat there, you've got it on the full setting and they're just like, yeah, it's fine. Um, so it, it, I guess it's a bit like injecting local anesthetic. Everybody has a different tolerance. You know, I've had kids who sat there and tolerated it and others who don't. So, um, yeah, it, it does really vary. And I, like I say, I think um, the, the theory with um, why some of them don't respond is it's actually there could be something else going on systemically with their immune system that they're not aware of. So whether it could be an allergy or I've got certainly got no evidence towards that, but um, that's something that I, I will start to talk to patients about. Um, and something I always ask at the start as well is, do you have any allergies? In saying that, I had a lady with rheumatoid arthritis and whose immune system was a bit all over the place. And another one who'd had um, extensive chemotherapy and it worked on both of those, even though we had low expectations. So yeah, yeah it's really hard to pinpoint why it doesn't work, um, but it's, it's minimal. I've I've certainly seen some really good successes. So, with um, how many treatments do you normally need to do with a Swift machine to get a result? Is it is it undetermined or there's no range? Yeah, so that's the great thing about it. It's it's evidence based, um, and that three treatments spaced four weeks apart is what is generally required. That doesn't mean that the wart will be gone at that time. Now I've had, again, when I looked at my stats, I looked at the average resolution rate in months and I think it came out at about 3.4 months was the average. I've had some that have gone after, I think I've had some after one session, quite a few that have gone after two sessions. And then I've had others that have needed maybe four or five sessions. Um, but we, how it is, sold as you do three treatments and then you give it a 12 week break now there are others out there who say you need to give it longer and i can the more i've used it because i've had it for about oh, maybe 18 months just close to yeah about 18 months now and the more i'm using it the more i'm starting to learn and one patient um we did maybe six sessions on her and they improved but they never fully went and then almost a year after we started the treatment, they just disappeared. Um, so it, you know, you could say it could just be time, but I think her body just needed that little bit more time to, to fight it off. Um, so yeah, some, some have took six months, but I'd say the majority within that sort of probably eight to maybe eight weeks to four or five months would be the the average um i think swift say themselves it on a, the the average time is 80 days after the last treatment but i've seen them go way quicker than that so how, how do you if a patient gets swift done and they don't get the result that you got you then they ruined that 20 percent yeah what do you do with them then what, what what's their next step um I've so some of them that I've seen um, have opted to wait. So I guess the ones where I've gone, they haven't resolved. They're just giving it a bit more time. Okay. Uh, surgery is another option. Send them off to a, a pod surgeon to explore surgical options. I, in my opinion, not always ideal. I've, I've had a patient who I've treated with Swift who'd had a walk cut out 
thought it had gone for a couple of years and then came back, um, whereas Swift worked well for him. So I think, yeah, it depends what else they, they've tried. Um, I think my, my advice to them is one, look at your lifestyle and to um, consider going to yeah, see a surgeon if they want to. Um, I think I, of the ones who haven't resolved, some of them have had improvements, but it hasn't fully gone. So some of them are still relatively happy um, and haven't necessarily explored other treatment options. Okay. So, and then when, and I suppose a lot of it too, it's a lot of education involved with the patient. Yeah. Right from the start, yeah, explaining what the ward is, how they got it, how the SWIFT machine is going to work, what the outcome is going to be. So there's a lot of ongoing communication all the way through the process. Yes, there is. Yeah, and that, that's important with the warts is getting them to understand what caused it and that it can be unpredictable. Um, like I say, a majority of the people I've treated have been really happy and they've been ones where they've tried other treatments. So they're then out there telling, you know, their friends that this is great. It works really well. Um, but if they do send their friends, I always start again with, you know, every person is different and you might not get the same results. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you, um, because the session we did on Tuesday, we were talking about implementing your equipment into your podiatry business. I don't know if you've seen that yet. I haven't, no. Yeah, and then we were sort of talking about when you're looking at getting equipment is there's there's a big process that you go through before you get it. And I said there's like, to me, there's three parts to it. There's the, almost the, like step one is do your patients really want this new piece of equipment? So say Swift, for example. How many patients do you currently have that have warts? As patients are coming in and they do have warts, talk to them about, would you be interested in this type of treatment if it was made available? So then all of a sudden you've got enough patients saying, yes, yes, yes. You go, okay, we need to get this equipment. So you made the decision. Then you order it, which is the step second part. But when you've ordered it, you're waiting for the equipment to arrive because you don't order it and arrives a week later. Usually there's a bit of a time delay. So then it's all the preparation, all the things that you do between the ordering and it arriving. And then when it arrives, then there's a whole marketing process when it arrives as well. So that's sort of what we we're talking about on Tuesday, which you just catch up and watch the replay. Yeah. <laughs> so when you decided that you were going to get this equipment, you said, yes, I'm going to do it. Did you do much pre-work beforehand telling people that it was there or did you just wait till it arrived? Um, no, I didn't. Um, that was probably my one, one downfall. Um, I started to tell some of the patients that I was already seeing in the clinic that it was coming and there was yeah. a, was an option. Um, but I, I didn't have a lot of time back then to do much of the preparation and, and get it out there other than the information for the website. Um, I would say would, would be the, the main things that I did. Yeah. It was one thing when we brought in the laser for fungal nails it was the same thing we went through that three-step process said to patients if we had this equipment would you be interested so it wasn't like doing your market research yes 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 went, oh okay let's get it when we decided we ordered it and i think at the time it was thirty thousand dollars to buy it but we had booked in about ten thousand dollars worth of work before the thing even arrived yeah. just just by generating, creating this excitement. And there was this whole process that we went through to do it. And so then when it did arrive, we pretty much paid the thing off in like 90 days because we had so much work booked in straight away. Then once it arrived, it was a whole uh, a whole new ball game once it was there and we were seeing the results from it and what was actually happening. Yes, yeah. And I think if I was to go back in time, I would definitely do that. I don't, I don't have any regrets. The machines paid off um, probably in just, just under a year, which working yeah. two or three days a week, I didn't think was too bad, but That's great. Um, it probably surprised me when I did go back and look through the numbers of patients that I've seen. I almost thought it might've been a bit more. So that, that was definitely a kick for me to go, right. We, we could be getting more people in, but I, I think, I, like I said, I'd mentioned it to some of my patients, the ones who I'd sent off to somebody else were keen for it. So I knew there was a demand there for it. Um, and then um, I, yes, yeah, that, that demand was there. Um, and I, 
I sat down and I just worked out, right, how many patients, if they all have their three treatments, how many, if, if the cost is X amount based upon what, you know, what others roughly were charging and what they recommended, then how many patients do I need to see? And when you broke it down like that, it actually wasn't many patients at all. Um, so that was when I was like, yep, yeah, seems like a big outlay, but it's actually not. And there is, um, I mean, not that it should dictate costs, but generally most patients have been pretty happy with the rebates they're getting back from their private health towards it, which really helps at times. I think if somebody's come in, most of them, I would say probably 60, 70% will just go for it. But some people have gone away and go, I'll just go check. And then they've come back and gone, yeah, it's fine. And so that, that helps to sell it as well, I think. I, I, th- I assume your word of mouth has started to really increase with this as well. So if somebody's Definitely. had treatment from you and wart treatment in other places that hasn't been successful and they're talking to anybody else who says, I have a wart, I will almost guarantee the first thing they're going to think of is, oh, go and see Chloe. Yeah. So this really yeah. cool piece of equipment. And yeah, so I can see the word of mouth really picking up, you know, month after month, year after year, the more, the longer you have this piece of, well, the longer you have the Swift machine. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It is word of mouth. And I think for the ones who have tried multiple other things and have had success, then they're stoked. They're out there telling everybody they know because they've, you know, they've, they've tried other things that just didn't work or were painful. Um, you know, like I say, Swift is, is painful to apply but it is very quick and there's no after pain. So in, you don't, it doesn't have any impact on once you walk out of that door, there's no impact on sport, exercise, lifestyle. You're not having to put any dressings on it. You don't have to keep it dry. It's very, very convenient treatment, which again, a lot of the patients like I've had quite a lot of, a lot of teenagers through and they just think it's great because it, it has no impact and they don't have to do a thing, which, you know, it's, it's always good in a teenager's world if the less they can do <laughs> to get better. Um, but how long yeah, it how long is it? How long is the treatment? Yeah. Um, yeah. The it ten seconds. Is that it? Yeah, uh, five lots of two second applications is the recommendation. We can vary that depending upon how they're responding, etc. But yeah, ten seconds. So it probably takes longer for the patient to get their shoes off, get on the chair check us check the wound take some photos and then yeah it's it's over and that's that's where it really surprises me with the pain threshold because i'm like it's not for a very long time at all have you got Um, a tattoo at all have you got any tattoos i don't so i haven't no um Uh, but but a patient i've heard talked about that that. (laughs) yeah so a patient brought a boyfriend last week for her third session and he started talking about tattoos um and he was saying because he was asking his girlfriend you know what what does it feel like and i'd said like you know the warts do have that nerve component to them so it depends how sensitive the area is as to your tolerance and he likened it to his tattoos and he said i you know i've got quite a lot and some areas i can sit there and i barely flinch but other areas it feels a lot more intense so it probably does depend a little bit on location and and how much nerve involvement there is in that area okay yeah it's a, i didn't realize because i've never used the equipment myself it wasn't yeah it was not what even spoken about five years ago as far as like people may have had it no it, it wasn't it. um i think it's it's about four or five years old i think um yeah. started in the uk and has been in australia for about three years i think now yeah yeah so it's i, I never used one, knew nothing about it didn't know how long each treatment took so that's why we wanted to get you on to talk about it because i knew you had it um yep. so before we finish up um do you have do you have a final tip there's somebody's listening to this and may, maybe they're thinking about getting one or they're thinking about maybe I just might refer my patients to someone who's actually got one. Do you have a final tip for anyone that's listening to this now? I think going back to the, um, that if you're thinking about doing it, don't hesitate or sit on the fence. Um, if you, if you think, if you can see the benefit in it to your patients, just do it, you'll make it work. Um, it'll yeah. It don't, don't stress over the cost or um, whether it'll be, be used or not. I think, it's got enough evidence behind it that 
it will work. I think that is fantastic. So, so Chloe, I want to thank you for coming on and um, talking about warts of all things to talk about. Well, we weren't really talking yeah. about warts, but we were talking about Swift, which is a machine that treats warts. So True. that is completely yeah. different. And, exactly. and so, it's not and a glamorous. It's not a. <laughs> it's not glamorous. But it's it's a solution to something that traditionally is a pain um, to treat and is not that nice. So you know, it's it. I guess that that's what I like about podiatry and what attracted me in the first place was I like the variety, but I also like the fact we could do a lot of things that got people. It was quick. We got pain relief pretty quick, and that swift fits into that that category. Um, it's not like physio where you're doing rehab yeah. potentially for weeks. You know, we can enucleate a colon and someone walks out feeling completely different to what they did 10 minutes ago. And Swift is exactly the same. Granted, it can be a little bit misleading and the wart's not going to disappear there and then, but it is a very quick treatment and overall is, is effective. No, I think it's awesome. So Chloe, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you.